Welcome everybody to another day together. Um, so excited to get started. So let's just start with prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everything you are trying to teach us about who we are in you. Thank you for today's Lord. Thank you for letting us understand how close you are to us. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, we are studying who God says we are. And so today, as we are stutter, studying who God says I am, we are going to find out today that God says, I am surrounded. Our I am statement is I am surrounded. Now, this one is a little different. This is not about our personality. It's not about our mindset. It's not about our behavior. It is not about the things that we've studied up to this point. This is such a cool part of our identity because it is actually a state of being that we are offered. It is a part of the package of being in relationship um, with God that this becomes a part of us. We don't have to do anything to, to have this as part of who we are. This is something that God freely and willfully gives us when we are in relationship with him. So this is a really cool place to learn of who he says we are because he makes some promises here that if we can rest in as a Christ follower, if we can just embrace these, this can change our life. Um, so we're going to start. We are going to, we're going to focus a little bit on the Psalms, but if you go to Facebook and get, look under Jot and Tittle, you will see the extra work for this week excuse me, for this day. And the extra work is going to take you in other portions of the Bible. It's going to take you in Exodus. It's going to take you to places um, in Isaiah. It's, going to, it's just going to kind of put it all together as some of the illustrations of how this I am statement looks in real life. Okay. If we have time, we'll try to hit some of those, but I have to be realistic. I run out of time quickly. Um, so let's hit the Psalms ones first, okay? We're going to start at Psalms 139. And I know I keep saying this, that I have favorite passages, but this is my go-to passage. This, this passage, um, I wish I could say I still have it all to memory, but with some of the things that have happened in my mind, I don't. Um, it's still very, very familiar, but I can't quote it word for word anymore. So I have to look it up and look it up. But it is a wonderful portion of scripture if you do want to memorize something. Um, it's also a wonderful portion of scripture if you want to write it down um, and hang it on your wall or put it on a mirror or put it on your car so that you see this, the beauty of this uh, Psalms. But we're only going to be put looking at just a portion of it today. Okay, so we are in Psalms 139. Yeah, if you know me, then you know 139. Okay, we're going to be looking at 139 and the whole chapter is very wonderful, but we're going to just pull out some pieces um, for sake of time and to focus on just this idea of being surrounded. Okay. So let's start at verse one and then we're going to skip. Okay. So verse one, sorry, verse one and two. Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. Okay. Are you getting how this begins? It's beginning with the acknowledgement of the place that God has in our life when we trust him. And David has entered into this intimate relationship with God. And so he is experiencing the reality and he's trying to describe it to us. He's trying to put into words what it feels like, what it looks like, what it, what it overwhelmingly just his response to the understanding that he is surrounded, that God is offering this to him. And he starts out this chapter by saying, God is so big in my life. I've come to understand him so much that I recognize, I'm willing to admit with my mouth that he knows me inside and out and that he is with me. I can't get out of his presence. And now, so now we're going to pick it up. And we're going to pick it at verse seven. And I want you to see this, okay? Because it's crazy. We are going to read, uh, 
Actually, we're going to hit verse 5 first and then skip to 7 because I don't want you to miss this out. So if we drop down to verse 5, he says, Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Now we're going to go back to that word enclosed in just a minute. Then we're going to pick it up at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is death, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, your hands will lead me. Your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as day. Darkness are alike to you. Okay, this is huge. So we're going to try to unpack just some of the pieces of it. Okay, let's look back at verse 5 because this is where the foundation is. And this is where we're going to kind of look at other portions of the scripture that, that reinforce this concept of, of him surrounding us, that that's part of our relationship. You have enclosed me behind and before. Now this word enclosed is synonymous with the word surround. Um, when you read it in your Bible and I ask you to go and look up the definitions, we're all going to come to the same definition. Okay. So when I say, look up this word, our words may be different, but the definitions are always the same when you look at the original text and the original intent. So that's why I have you look things up so much so we don't get trapped in, in earthly words or in English words, okay? So this word surround. Now, if you just look up this word surround in a basic dictionary, I mean, I would. that's the simplest way. If you look at it in a Bible dictionary, it's going to be very similar. And what this word surround or enclose means, to, it means to be circled in. So you are encircled. All right. Now this scripture says that he recognizes that he is enclosed by God, but he only uses two words behind and before I did that wrong behind and before. Okay. So that gives us the, maybe the, the false illusion that God's just in front of us and just behind us. But the word enclosed means you're in the center of the circle. And he is encircling you. His presence is surrounding you. There's no gaps. It's not just, you know, a front and a back like you're in a line. No. It is an all-encompassing, completely enclosed, encircled, and surrounded by God. And that's why David makes these statements. He, you know, he's, he's saying to God, he's, he's voicing to God that he gets it that the light bulb has gone off in his head and he's doing all these scenarios. He's saying, God, if I'm at the top of the mountain, he doesn't mention how he gets to the mountain. He's just saying, God, I realize that if I go to a mountain, you're going to follow me there. You're going to already be there. And if, if I go and try to want to run away from you, kind of like Jonah did, he recognizes there's no running away from him, that he is always encircling and surrounding us. He talks about going to Sheol, where he lays in his bed to die, and still God is there. He talks about what happens if he took residence in the bottom of the sea where no man lives. God would still be in that bottom of the sea with him. So David responding by saying all these scenarios, he's saying, God, I believe you. I believe you when you say to me that you surround me. There is nowhere that I can go. In fact, you know, those verses 11 and 12, I love. Because he's saying, even if I can't see anything. But he's also talking about a di different darkness. He's not just talking about the void of light. He is also saying, even if he's in the middle of all evil, that everything around him is bad and evil and sinful still god is there just encircling him the picture and the depth and the width of what 
David is, is responding to God saying, I get it. I want so badly for, for myself and you to get to this point where David is, where he securely holds on to the promise that God makes that when we are his people, he surrounds us. Now, this is where you're going to go in your um, extra work, where you're going to go to Exodus. And you're going to see firsthand the kind of ways that God surrounded his people. He promised his people he was always going to be there. And so in the Exodus portions, it's going to tell you he's here, he's there, he's here, he's there. No matter what they see around them, whether it's in a physical earthly battle where... <laughs> people are on all sides or whether it's more of a um, an emotional dilemma or a spiritual dilemma when they're encased in darkness he's still there so with that image I, I, I want us to check out a couple more of these psalms let's go to let's go to psalms 32 and let's just look at what this says psalms 32 verse 7 Okay, here it is again, this, this understanding. He says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the songs of deliverance. This gives us a little bit more insight into David's uh, comments in Psalms 139. Because in one, Psalms 139, he's kind of giving us scenarios Um they don't sound like very realistic scenarios, you know, going on a mountain, riding on the wings of an eagle. But here David is showing us that he learned this because of firsthand experience with God. He is sharing with us and, and he gives us a lot of information in this chapter. So read the whole chapter. But he is telling us that God has surrounded him with songs of deliverance. That means that David has recognized all God's intervention. That he recognizes that God has put places of deliverance all around him in his life. And those, those details, those encounters with God have deepened his faith to the understanding of how big God is in his life and how God is constantly with him. So again, we see David's response to God's state of being for us as his people. God says we're surrounded and David is sharing this with us of how he has experienced it. And it's beautiful. It's not all happy schmappy. I mean, David has been in war, but yet he still felt God's presence. It says here, He's his hiding place. I don't know if you've studied the story of David, but David actually went into literal hiding because he was being sought after to be killed. And that happened on more than one occasion. So in those horrible encounters, David experienced firsthand God's promise to surround him, to surround those that are God's. We get that same promise. All right, let's hit one more Psalms. Uh, I don't think we have time for two more, but let's go to Psalms 125. That's a good one too. Um, 125. Oh, this is so cool. It's again, one of those scenarios where you're like, this is too big for me to understand. But it's written that way purposefully so that we understand that this is not something that we can tangibly just say, oh yeah, I understand that completely. Being surrounded by him is something we cannot, cannot ever completely fathom. Because his, his quality of being omnipresent, which means he is everywhere at any time. He's always there. Um, his, I, the idea of him being omniscient, that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing. Those just make our brain hurt because they're too big. We can't put an earthly handle on that. So some of these things that are in the Bible that, that put it at a grander, you know, a grander scale help us understand the reality of what God is actually promising us in relationship with him. So in verse 125, we're going to read verses uh, 1 and 2. 
those who trust in the Lord. Again, I hate to be the one who recognizes this, but there is a qualification. You know, all the things that we've covered so far, they're who God says we are. When we choose to accept him as the ruler of our life, we can't be in charge of ourselves, focusing on everything that we want and expect to have the identity of who God says. We, they're not equal. You can't take all that God wants you to be and reject God. The only way that you can be all that God says you are is to be with God. Do you understand that? That there has to be a qualification here. All of these things that we are learning about who God says we are, are reserved for those who accept God's opinion in their life. You know, if, if you don't trust in God, if you don't, if you're not a Christ follower, then why do you care what he says about you? You know, it seems kind of silly. So we are presented all the time with this understanding that God says, if, if you trust me, if you serve me, if you obey me, if you follow me, that's the qualifier to all of these identities in him. So here he says it again, those who trust me, those who trust the Lord, those who care about what God says, those who want to give God the charge, it, the control of their life. That's who this is for. Those who trust the Lord are as Mount Zion, which was an amazing mountain, still is a mountain, um, that the people of Israel were familiar with. So it, it, it'd be like saying um, the Himalayas or Mount Everest, whatever mountain you know is, is close to you, the Smokies, the Rockies. I mean, there's mountains all over the world. But at this time, what was familiar to God's people was this Mount Zion. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion that can't be moved but abides forever. He is saying that for those who trust him and who follow him, you are as immovable, immovable as a mountain. That mountain, you can't move it. Although we're going to learn later a little bit more about being mountain movers. But in all reality, in the physical world, that mountain's going to stay put. And he is calling us as stable and as grounded and as permanent as a mountain. Those of you who trust me are like a permanent land fixture. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. So you see, God is drawing this picture for us to understand what he is trying to tell us. He is saying, okay, you know that mountain? That mountain that you know is so big and so large? You, you know that you can't take that down. You know that you can't go over there even one bucket at a time. You still will never make progress in, in removing that mountain from this earth. So they understood that language. Okay, if, if, if I trust God, he sees me as just this solid place. And then he goes further in our identity and he says, it's kind of like how Jerusalem is smack dab protected by this mountain range. Okay, now go to a map site, go to, to any place that will show you what ancient Jerusalem looked like. And you will see that where they're located was kind of a protectable place. It was kind of tucked in. It was also surrounded by walls. Okay, so Jerusalem would be considered a place um, that had an advantage. It, it, it had an advantage to where enemies couldn't really come at all different sides. It was tucked in a nice, a nice place. And so God is saying to them, 
just as Jerusalem is kind of surrounded by mountains, so are you surrounded by me. You see, this took it to a deep level for them, illustration-wise, because they understood what it meant to be surrounded by mountains because that was a portion of protection. They Geographically, it was a nice place for them to be. Um, and so they recognized that being in the midst, being encircled by land masses, gave them a an advantage over anybody that would try to attack them. So when you think that God is using that as an illustration, these these guys were understanding that God wasn't just offering his presence. He was also offering protection. So they were being surrounded by God who was offering them a defense against what would come against them. They had a one-up on the enemy. God in this shows us that he wasn't intending for this to just be a one-time deal. And, and we can prove that because we can go all the way back to Genesis and Exodus and see how he did it in the past. That was long before David wrote this. We can go forward all the way to Revelation, which takes us past what we even have lived through. And from front to back, this is, this is a, according to this, this is a from time forth and forever. This is a permanent state with God for those who trust him. We have an advantage over the enemy just by where we stand what our state of being, what our position is in God. Is that, is that starting to come through? Is the light bulb starting to go off? Um, because this is huge. Because this goes past an identity of just being something that we can contain or understand about us, within us, or the way that we behave. This is way bigger than us. This is ginormous. He says, we are surrounded. We are enclosed. We are encircled. He goes in front of us. He goes behind us. When you go back to Exodus, you're going to see all of these illustrations of how God proves to them that he's behind them, that he's before them, that he's next to them, that he is encircling them. My goodness, in Exodus, he even gives them this giant pillar of fire and this giant pillar of cloud so that they can see, tangibly see, that God is with them behind and, per and before. It's amazing. When we can grasp that as a person, as a people of God, as those who trust him, we can rest in this beautiful identity that we are surrounded. Then we don't have to spend so much time fretting about what the enemy can do to us. We have a one-up on the enemy. Now, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't say that the enemy isn't going to attack. It doesn't say that you're not going to be in some kind of wars or hardships. It doesn't say that. It just says in that. He surrounds us. He encircles us. The enemy isn't sneaking in. You see, if the enemy ends up in your territory, God knows he's in there. And he allowed for him to come in because he has something planned. Only he can use something that the enemy would do to us to become something great and glorious. So this scripture allows us to see differently. There is a song out um, today that is, um, I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. I don't know the name of it. I'm terrible with names. But I find myself humming that. And I find myself, that comes up in my Spotify quite a bit. Um, and 
every time I hear that song, I recognize, I remember the promise of who he says we are, of what we get by being his. It's part of the package. I'm going to throw a little twist on this, and then I'll leave you to think about that. Much like David and much like the references that you're going to see in Exodus and in Isaiah. You're going to go to Isaiah today as well. And you're going to see actual scenarios. And the scenarios that they're talking about aren't, aren't necessarily good scenarios. But in those dark places, in those, in those trapped places, in those uh, vulnerable places, they're able to make the statement that God is leading them. That they know doggone well that even though they're in that spot, that God is in there with them. So when you look around and you see crisis and hurt and just attack and, and darkness, I want you to understand that, yes, those things may be there, but there is a circle that is even closer than those things. And that's the presence of God surrounding you. So when I hum that song that I'm surrounded by him, I actually picture in my life some of the battles that I've been in where the devil felt like he was this close to me. And I recognize that even when all I could see was attack and ugly and scary, I have come to recognize that even in those things, the enemy might have been this close, but God was this close. Nobody can penetrate that encircling that is so close. So whatever you are seeing around you, please embrace the beautiful truth that he says you're surrounded by him. And everything else that surrounds you at that moment pales in comparison. That has given me the strength to face lots of different things in life because I know that God's circle around me is closer than anything that any man or any evil could ever get to me. So ponder that today and really embrace this idea that God, he says, I am surrounded. He says, you are surrounded. So please go, go, go do the extra work today because it, it is worth the extra time. I will see you guys tomorrow.